this time on Superstars, five British thespians who've been having a very jolly time in Hollywood. Over the years, the very proper Helena Bonham Carter has been at the centre of more than her fair share of tabloid gossip. After playing Emma Thompson's sister in Howard's End in 1992, she went on to play the love interest of Emma's husband, Kenneth Branagh, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The pair allegedly became an item while Ken and Em were still married and continued their relationship until 1999. After being romantically linked to Steve Martin and Rufus Sewell, she then reportedly embarked on a romance with her Planet of the Apes director Tim Burton while he was engaged to actress Lisa Marie. Since then, it seems the great-granddaughter of Prime Minister Herbert Asquith seems to have found her match in the eccentric director of fantasy classics like Edward Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas and Batman, with whom she shares two children. They live in adjoining houses with a connecting hallway in swanky London suburb Belsize Park. Their unconventional living arrangements are said to satisfy their need to be close to each other while preserving their own space. No doubt the luxury of being able to retreat to their own wing after a hard day's work together has also helped them maintain their close working relationship. Since Planet of the Apes in 2001, Helena has appeared in every one of Tim's film projects. In 2003, she played Jenny the Witch in Big Fish. There are lots of t morals to the tale, and I think it's quite complex, but it's quite a useful message for kids that, you know, death doesn't necessarily have to be scary, you know, and it's us who impose on the young mind of a child that it might be frightening. So, uh, so for those who do think it's frightening, or it's a good introduction to death, you know, because we none of us know, you know, really. During her downtime, she also gave voice to the character Lady Campanula Tottington in the Wallace and Gromit adventure, The Curse of the Weir Rabbit. You, big ears. <laughs> no! After painstakingly lengthy production periods, both films were released in 2005, and all Helena's hard homework was rewarded with a Cine Award for Wallace and Gromit and an Annie Award for The Corpse Bride. The same year, she was on the red carpet talking up yet another Tim Burton film in which she starred, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Her role as the young hero's mother brought with it irresistible temptation. I'm pretty bad. How bad? My drug of choice. Well, I try, um, I like dime bars and Galaxy, but I mean, I know that I'm an addictive personality, so I try not to stop, you know, because I will eat, I'm the sort of person who will eat the whole box, yeah. <laughs> it's a good drug. Reporters were also keen to know how she found working with her partner. It's fine, actually. It's, it's surprisingly uncomplicated. It's pretty much the same. Sometimes he's a bit like, uh, you know, he bosses me around and he refers to me as she. Uh, but it's fine. Yeah, and I get to see him, so that's good. After that, however, she was delighted to take time out from their cosy collaborations to play one of Lord Voldemort's right-hand Death Eaters in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Really honoured. I just think she's a genius, J.K. Brown. So I was really, you know, and this is a like, it was a fun part. She's a witch, it's a tiny part. I told it, it gets bigger. Better. <laughs> Happily for Helena, her character of Bellatrix Lestrange is reprised in the last two instalments. Another fun thing she got to do on her own was sit on the jury and judge films in competition at the 2006 Cannes Film Festival. It's fun because, you know, you're in a position of power. Especially as an actor, on the, on the whole, we're in a position of begging. You know, we go around begging people for... We're in a depraved position. We want people to employ us. So Tim said it is fun in the sense that people tend to suck up to you because uh, that is if, you know, their film is in competition and uh, they want to uh, get a prize. So I thought, well, that might be fun. Before appearing in the next episode of the blockbuster franchise Harry Potter. It's great fun and, and also it was just everybody, no one had done it. He, it was his first musical, Tim's first musical, Johnny, me, everyone. It was, it was a great sense of um, excitement and, and risk taking, but it was, it, was, uh, it was just brilliant. It was really great fun. All the risk taking proved worth it when Helena won an evening standard British Film Award.
At the British Independent Film Awards, another upper crust actress, Emily Mortimer, admitted that her posh accent and genteel manners would rule her out of being cast in gritty working class dramas. Well, I've always been um, a, a massive Ken Loach fan, so I, I, I'd be pleased to see him win something. Um, and uh, I know I'll never ever be in a Ken Loach film, so I'm far too middle class, <laughs> a Sloan Ranger. <laughs> I don't think there's real, r really room for me in one of his films, but I remain an adamant fan, so I'd like to see him win something. Emily's 2004 film, Dear Frankie, may not have won any awards, but it did garner rave reviews and a standing ovation when it premiered at Cannes. It was great preparation for the media buzz that was to surround the release of her next movie, Woody Allen's Match Point. I can't get over it. You know, I've never been in a film that's been this well received, and it's so nice not to be slogging around some lovely indie movie that you've just put your life and soul into, begging people to watch it. And this time, I feel like people want, to, you know, genuinely interested before we've even begun, and it's just such a nice feeling. And the award nominations mean that more and more people are going to get to see the movie. I think my career the murder thriller broke a long-running streak of flops for Woody by pulling in more than $85 million at the box office and earning a swag of award nominations, including a nod for Best Screenplay at the Academy Awards. Emily was in awe of the veteran director's genius. The way that he positions the camera, Woody, is completely original. It's unlike anyone else. It completely is organic to the world that he creates in his movies, this kind of mad anti-romantic comedy or whatever it is. It's like this third person peering in on this terrible domestic situation. After playing a string of lasses, virgins and young ladies throughout the 1990s and early 2000s in films like Elizabeth, Notting Hill and Lovely and Amazing, Hollywood was finally recognizing the fact that the 24-year-old English actress had come of age at the 12th annual Women in Hollywood celebration. I'm pleased to know I'm a woman. I never really thought of my... I always felt like I wasn't very convincing as a woman. I was a much better girl than I was a woman. So I'm delighted to hear that I am one. <laughs> and um, it's always very exciting to get, you know, dressed up and go out. And, but um, it's quite stressful also one worries about how one looks. As a woman in Hollywood, I can tell you one worries about how one looks. One looked rather good as Steve Martin's love interest in the 2006 remake of The Pink Panther. At the premiere, she declared she hadn't been at all phased by the jump from tense drama to slapstick comedy. My father once said to me, my father's a writer, and he said that comedy is actually tragedy speeded up. It's like a speeded up version of, of, of tragedy, you know. Um, it, it's sad things happening at a million miles an hour, um, which I think is kind of quite a good definition of comedy. Emily's father's achievements as a writer included penning the classic English TV series Rumpole of the Bailey. Clearly, his talents rubbed off on Emily, who once wrote a column for the Daily Telegraph and wrote a screen adaptation of Lorna Sage's memoir, Bad Blood. In 2007, her ability to straddle comedy and drama helped her to stay straight-faced when confronted with her brother-in-law's plastic girlfriend in Lars and the Real Girl. The so-called dramedy earned critical applause as a gentle, offbeat comedy that's never cute, never lewd, and never goes for shortcut laughs that might diminish character. Oh, my, no, no, no. Over the next two years, Emily's growing fan club of peers within the film industry are promising to keep her busy. As well as signing up for the Pink Panther sequel, she's been cast in Martin Scorsese's forthcoming thriller, Shutter Island. One British actor who has never had to worry where the next job is coming from is Jeremy Irons. Born in the Isle of Wight in 1948, he trained as an actor at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School and scored early success on the stage in 1971 as John the Baptist in the musical Godspell. He broke through on television and on film in 1981, playing Charles Ryder in Brideshead Revisited and Charles Henry Smithson in The French Lieutenant's Woman. In 1990, his portrayal of a wealthy socialite trying to overturn two convictions for attempted murder won him an Oscar for Best Actor, and he's worked steadily in film ever since. 
His stiff upper lip and effete manner have led him to being cast in an endless roll call of period pieces and costume dramas, like Kafka, The Man in the Iron Mask and Swan in Love. In 2002, he played the former manager of Maria Callas in Franco Zeffirelli's homage to the opera diva, who was also a close friend. We were watching a piece of footage of Maria, and he was just sucked in to this vision, and then the tears started, and I thought, this is a very important subject for him. And it's wonderful, you know, when you have a director who has passion for his subject. It, it spreads to you like a virus. After Callas Forever, he played another Grand Divas admirer in Being Julia. Set in 1930s London, his character is married to actress Julia Lambert, played by Annette Bening. Although his attention sometimes strays from the marital bed, he never fails to be captivated by his wife's brilliance and talents at playing people. During filming in Hungary, Jeremy saw some similarities between his on-screen marriage and his home life. Uh, she makes a wife rather like my wife, very changeable. Um, uh, sometimes black, sometimes white, sometimes fire, sometimes water. Um, she is... Uh, a wife of moods and of passion, a uh, very interesting wife. Being married to an actress um, stops you getting bored, I find. After 30 years of marriage to Irish actress Sinead Cusack, it appears that the feeling may well be mutual. He went even further back in time in 2005 to play the clerical persecutor Pucci in the period romp Casanova, starring Heath Ledger and Sienna Miller. What was the name of this vile seducer? Giacomo Casanova. After so many heavy dramas, he was grateful for some light relief. It's a great film. It's a lot of fun, you know. Normally the films I do are a bit sort of serious, but actually this film is, uh, is a great laugh and everybody seems to enjoy it. After that, it was back down to the serious business of slaughtering infidels in the Ridley Scott epic Kingdom of Heaven. The film was shot in Spain and Morocco. The budget of $130 million allowed for the creation of 15,000 costumes based on more than 1,000 drawings produced by the art department in Rome. Playing Tiberius, the advisor to King Baldwin IV, didn't present too many problems for the veteran actor who's taken part in more than his fair share of big blockbusters. It makes it easier that if you have great sets, great costumes, if you have uh, thousands of extras, it actually makes it easier because you have to pretend less. Yeah. So it was wonderful for us to have all that. And then, of course, uh, with CGI, you, make, you turn those thousands into 10,000, and, and on the screen, it just blows you away. He and his family were even more blown away at a screening of his next big budget adventure, Eragon, the 2006 live action dragon fantasy film based on the novel of the same name. I have. I saw it with my wife and my, our dogs and one other person, and uh, the dogs are terrified of the dragon. I've been spending um, the whole rest of the week trying to talk them down. They talk now about wanting flying lessons, and they're getting way above themselves, and they keep being, ah, and hoping that they'll, fire will come out. It was quite traumatic for them, I think, to see the dragon, which is extremely lifelike. After Eragon, he starred in back-to-back -back television miniseries. In The Colour of Magic, based on Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, he played head of state Lord Havelock Vetinari. And in Elizabeth I, he won an Emmy and a Golden Globe for his portrayal of the Virgin Queen's favourite, Robert Dudley. I love you as you should be loved. Like Helena Bonham Carter, London-born actress Rachel Weisz has survived working with her director partner. She called Darren Aronofsky boss on the long-awaited follow-up to his 1999 film Requiem for a Dream. The Fountain took Hugh Jackman on a mystical odyssey as he tries to find a cure for cancer to save his wife, played by Rachel, from dying. At the film's 2006 premiere, Rachel spoke about the experience. I think The Fountain's definitely, uh, it's definitely an intense film. I think it's also very romantic, and I think it's 
uh, full of love and hope, and uh, it's kind of like a fantasy, a fantasy romantic love story. So that was that was my work, and then my real life. Um, it was after we finished making the film that I uh, I became pregnant and had a baby. So they were they were they were two very different, equally intense but very different experiences. Having given birth to their son Henry three months before the film's release, reporters were out for a scoop. No plans for marriage right now, no. <laughs> OK. Since then, there have been rumblings that Rachel, who was raised in a Jewish household in the Swish London suburb of Hampstead, is planning a traditional ceremony at the oldest synagogue in New York. The couple met back in 2002, and by then, Rachel had started making a name for herself on the big screen with roles in the Bernardo Bertolucci film Stealing Beauty and the adventure blockbuster The Mummy. Things started to... When I met Ed Burns in the direction we were doing our first like, initial rehearsal, I just went... I decided I'll just turn up with an American accent because... I just felt like it would be easier. Like, Ed would take me more seriously if I turned up like that than talking like English. So, yeah, I did, and he thought I was American, so, yeah. However, her role as a pickpocket did require some on-the-job training from a magician. He, if he was talking to you now, he'd be able to, like, get your belt off you and pick your pocket and get your watch off without you noticing. And it's all about distraction. He'd touch you here and say, oh, that's beautiful. You've got beautiful hands. And while he was distracting you there, he'd pick your pocket. So he taught me the fundamentals of uh, picking pockets. She also starred in the film version of Neil Lebute's play The Shape of Things and got to work with Dustin Hoffman again in The Runaway Jury, along with Gene Hackman and John Cusack. Needless to say, Rachel was beside herself. I mean, there are three actors who are at the, the top of the game. You know, they, it, it doesn't get much better than Hackman and Hoffman and Cusack. They're, they're extraordinarily talented actors, and it was inspiring uh, to work with them, and it was an honor, it was a privilege. She was still clearly feeling inspired in 2005 when she impressed co star Ralph Fiennes on the set of the big screen adaptation of John Lacari's novel The Constant Gardener. Yeah, we had a great time. Great. I think we have good chemistry, if that's the right word. But uh, no, she's a fantastic actress. How are you? How are you? Rachel's performance as an activist who is found brutally murdered in Kenya also wowed critics who tipped her to win a Best Supporting Oscar over the likes of Michelle Williams, Frances McDormand and Amy Adams. On the red carpet on the way in, Rachel was just glad to be along for the ride. Well, I've never even been to the Oscars, so to come here for my first time as a nominated supporting actress, it's a huge, huge honour. And, and it, of course it is a dream, it's all actors' dream that maybe one day I'll be at the Academy Awards. And, and, here, I, and here I am. And I, I know it's a cliche to say, but it really would be enough, it's enough to be nominated. The buzz proved to be on the money, and Rachel looked radiant, despite being seven months pregnant. Just two weeks earlier, she'd hauled her baby bump up to the stage to accept another impressive award after being named Most Stylish Celebrity by Elle magazine. After scooping up her various accolades and giving birth to Henry, it was on to the release of The Fountain and Aragon, for which she lent her voice to the character Sapphira. After completing three films in 2009, Rachel has signed up to play Ava Lord in the sequel to graphic novel action flick Sin City. Still in her teens, French-born British actress Emma Watson has made her name playing just the one role. The early bloomer apparently decided she wanted to become an actress at the age of six, and four years later she starred in a school play. Whether or not that was the full extent of her acting experience when she landed the star-making role of Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter series is not entirely clear, but certainly she had never acted professionally. When casting began for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in 1999, she was recommended by her Oxford theatre teacher and the producers were impressed with her confidence. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling was reportedly sold on Emma from her first screen test, and eight auditions later, she was offered the job. Off the Mandrake route? Yes, Miss Granger. Mandrake? 
or mandragora is used to return those who've been petrified to their original state. In the year 2000, Emma, along with the film's other two stars, Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint, gave their first press conference. On the subject of what she would do with her huge pay packet, she sounded very sensible. I'm afraid I'm really going to bore all of you, but um, I'm afraid I'm going to stick it in a bank until I'm 21. <laughs> <laughs> Just over a year later, she was dancing around at the London premiere of the first film, stealing the show just as many critics had suggested she'd done in the film. Far from being overawed by the experience of working on a multi-million dollar project alongside the likes of British acting legends like Richard Harris, Maggie Smith and Alan Rickman, she found the whole thing a breeze. It wasn't that difficult, but it was. Ab she's got a great charisma. And she's just fantastic. I love her character. She makes me laugh. Clearly, her six-year-old instinct to pursue acting as a career had been spot on. At the age of 11, she'd become a household name, at least to the legions of Harry Potter fans, who helped the Philosopher's Stone, or the Sorcerer's Stone as it was called in the US, to nearly $1 billion at the box office. At the premiere of the next film, she was still bowled over by all the fuss. I cannot believe how many people are out there, but it's absolutely amazing and I'm really overwhelmed. Three years and two instalments later, she and her castmates had become best friends. Not only had they spent much of the past five years filming together, they'd also taken school lessons for up to five hours a day on set. At the launch of the Goblet of Fire DVD, they were all clearly used to the media frenzy. I think what really comes across is the sense of family, friendship, um, and I just think, I mean, obviously I've never been in any other films, but um, I can't imagine ever feeling like I feel when I'm here. However, she had a word of warning about the fourth film in the franchise. It is a, it is a scarier film. It's, it's darker, it's much more of a thriller than it ever has been before. But at the same time, I think that he's also managed to pull off the funniest film yet. There's a lot of humour in it, so balance is out. In 2006, rumours surfaced that Emma didn't want to continue with the Harry Potter films. However, a year later, the three comrades looked as inseparable as ever as they sealed their celebrity status by sinking their hands, feet and wands into the cement in front of Grumman's Chinese Theatre in Hollywood. Um, I'm, I, I'm so honoured to be here. I, I really, this, I think this will be the biggest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I think, um, yeah, I, wow, yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> Clearly, she'd gotten over her collie wobbles and had signed on for the remaining three episodes in the series. Hey, hold 